Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Good morning, good morning. Happy Thursday morning from Jerusalem. My name is Andrea Simitov, and you are listening to Pull Up a Chair on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Okay, in our romper room moment, I want to say good morning, good evening to people listening in live on this morning's live show, which of course will be uh, recorded as a podcast available to your ongoing and frequent listening pleasure. Um, I want to say hello to the United States. And um, they're listening in from England tonight, the UK, Australia. It's a little later in the day there. Boket Tov, Eretz Israel. Ireland's listening in, Switzerland, Denmark, Brazil, France, and good morning, Jamaica. Okay, uh, tonight in most of the world falls Purim, the holiday of masks. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about that today. You know, I thought to myself, maybe I'm getting lazy. I only talk about Torah and I only talk about um, the joy of Judaism. And I only talk about what our role is in making the world a better place. Tikkun olam kezeh. And I realized, no, no, it's where my happiness comes from. I decided the people on this station, they do the politics so well. They really, they parse it and they can take it. They can, they put on their boxing gloves and they argue back and they're so good and they're so strong and not my thing. I take a look into the chat room and sometimes I see so much anger. Let's not do anger. Let's only do love. Let's only do friendship. Let's listen to each other. Okay. Tonight is Purim. Uh, not so different from last year's Purim. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about how the world literally, approxim- literally, literally approximately, that is English, um, changed. A year ago, just about now, when we started to take this thing from the Far East, from Wuhan, seriously. And as we were preparing our Purim readings and our Purim costumes and our Purim meals, we began thinking about masks, began hoarding alcohol gel, and began thinking it will be over very soon. It's only a picture from a horror movie. My name is Andrea Simito. Let's talk more about Wuhan and Purim on the other side. Israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world. Israel is an island of stability and a sea of war and unrest. In the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Back. Andrea Simintov, pull up a chair on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. This is our Purim show. All right, a lot of very nice, very warm, very loving, very appropriate back and forth in the chat room today. And uh, if you are listening in, let me know where you're listening in from. Okay, I like to know, and it um, I like to have friends. <laughs> All right, so in addition to all these wonderful listeners from around the world, apparently both the Netherlands and Estonia have joined the live audience, and that makes me happy. Okay, today is a fast day, a day of no eating, and um, uh, some people, there are some people who do not fast, but many, many observant Jews do, and it's the fast of Esther. And just to tell you what the genesis is, um, Mordechai, 
Mordechai, who's the hero of our tale, we have the hero and heroine of the tale, says, I, I promise you there'll be nothing in this show that is PC, all right? I, I, no one's going to suck us into that, all right? It's exhausting, all this wokeness. All right, so Mordechai, he tells his niece, you know, the evil Haman has issued a decree to destroy the Jewish people, kill the Jewish people, eradicate the Jewish people. And Mordechai tells his niece, who has surreptitiously married the king, and that'll be next year's show. We'll talk about just how that weird thing happened. And he says to her, you have to stand behind your mortal king and speak up for the Jewish people. And what does Esther say? She's got herself a nice deal there. It's a cushy, cushy little harem room, and she's very happy. And she only, you only go when he calls you. If he doesn't call you and you show up, the writing is on his wall, and it says death. And she says, he's going to kill me. He's unstable. He has not called. And Mordecai says to her, you know, of course, this is all extrapolated and the Andrea interpretation, but it's pretty close to what happened because I was there, uh, Mordechai says to her, you know, Jewish history is going to play out. But what will your role be? God will redeem the Jewish people. We are eternal. You know, Esther, perhaps this is the entire purpose for which you were created. And the rest, as we say, is history. She shows up uninvited, people gasping around the chutzpah, the unmitigated goal, she does go to him, announces who she is. Most tellingly, she announces what she is. And he, well, we know the rest of the story. But we say to ourselves, are we willing to step up to destiny? I don't know. It's a rough one. All right. As we were saying before the show started, uh, this year feels as undifferent as last year, which felt as undifferent, as different as anything could be. We remember, we kept saying, it'll be over, it'll be over, it'll be over. This is such a terrible thing. Um, again, here in Israel, Purim celebrations, the place has been closed down from 8.30 at night until 5 in the morning, trying hard to um, kind of rein in the spread of the disease. And um, it's, it's just a different vibe, a very different vibe, a strange vibe, a little bit of a sad vibe. But for many of us, we can kind of sense, we say in Hebrew, there's an avak, a dust, a, a fairy dust sprinkling of a light at the end of the, tu the tunnel. Okay, uh, so this week, again, we have like a mixed, you know, here in Jerusalem, we actually do the uh, Purim celebrating, unlike the rest of the world who's having Purim tomorrow, uh, the meal is tomorrow, they're delivering, I think, the Mishloach Manus, the gifts, gift baskets, I believe tomorrow, they're listening, but we all listen to Megillah tonight and tomorrow morning, but in Jerusalem, because we are a walled city, just as Shushan, um, the city in Persia was a walled city, so we celebrated on Sunday. So I think we'll do like a little bagel lux breakfast. All right. Big, big feature of this week's Parsha, Torah Parshan, and you know that we're all learning together. The Parsha actually opens up with instructions to the children of Israel for making of the Ner Tamid. The Ner Tamid is that eternal light, that light that burns in the synagogue um, all the time, day and night, night and day. You may have seen it in your own shuls. The Ner Tamid first appears in the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, with all those intricate instructions. And the Ner Tamid also burned in the base Hamigdash, the holy temples. Now, there are a lot of details. I have to tell you, I'm learning with you. A lot of this stuff wasn't really that important to me. It wasn't the fun stuff, the fun stuff of Genesis. I mean, the Genesis was love, lust, jealousy, killing, you know, envy. That was like the good stuff. And now here we're getting down to the nitty gritty. You know, who wants to talk about, you know, T-squares and bolts? But the more I'm listening, it's very interesting. Um, 
the the olive oil let's see we want to talk a lot about a, a lot about olive oil oh yeah um specific complicated details indicate that the flame was desired by god for a hidden a very holy purpose still the gemara tells us what god is really saying is created for you not for me i don't need light so if the light was entirely for all for our sake why does this torah go on and on and on you know about how to do it. Isn't a nightlight a nightlight? The near tamid cannot have been meant for a flashlight. There's a saying, Ner Hashem nishmat adom. The candle of God is the soul of man. So perhaps an analogy is meant to be drawn, just my thought here, <laughs> correct me if I'm, lo- if I'm wrong, says the uh, life coach, that the near tamid and the nishama, the soul, are connected because every detail of this eternal light can be matched to a detail of an ideal soul. So again, this near tamid is fueled by olive oil, not canola, not soy, not hydrogenated uh, vegetable oils, but by olive oil in order to produce the only fuel which is fitting for the soul. Anything else is like, I got this great example, do you like this? Like diesel in a Porsche. You know, the other motivations destroy the soul. It can run well temporarily, perhaps, diesel in a Porsche, but ultimately we're going to blow the motor. Also, the oil of the nair, I hope you're writing down and learning your Hebrew here. The nair is the a candle, um, is fueled by olive oil in order to, um, it also has no sediment. Sediment is a signal of stagnation. Every action, I mean, we know we don't drink from a stagnant pond. Every action and inaction affects the status of our soul, not allowing for stagnation. Technically, there is a concept, there is a concept like doing the minimum fulfillment of a mitzvah. But like a person trying to survive on minimum wage or survive on the poverty line salary, or a student who's aiming to keep that grade, (laughs) reaching for that grade of 65, a soul aiming for just the minimum is going to slip under the line a lot more often, a lot more often, more often than not. The oil of that ner tamid has to be crushed from the olive. It's the most precious drops that come from a teeny yet abundantly grown fruit. It cannot be obtained by grinding, which produces a majority of the olive's juices. Similarly, although we're required to press ourselves to fulfill the mitzvah, my friends, there's no commandment to destroy ourselves in the process. At the same time, every Jew has to fulfill lehaalot ner to try again if he doesn't succeed the first time around. I tried, I did it once. It's not enough to rekindle a flame. Until the fire is strong, what do we have to do? We must keep adding fuel. And here comes the hint. Here's where you like put the, you, you, you line up your dots. The final Nair Tamid specification is that the flame must be relit every day. Uh, Learned of someone new. Hold on, here's the paper. Got that? Okay. My home studio is so warm and toasty this morning. Yes. Okay, so according to, I had never heard of the Tzror Hamor. The Tzror Hamor was named Avraham Saba, and he was a rabbi from actually Castile, Spain, and he lived during the Inquisition. He he fled, actually saved his life. And what does he have to say about the Ner Tamid? Mamash, not politically correct, my favorite. Israel is likened to an olive which yields up its oil when it is crushed. For Israel reveals its true virtues only when it is made to suffer. The Jews are also likened to the oil, which does not mix well with other liquids, but always remains on top because the Jews always manage to remain above other nations and do, and we do not mingle well with them. It's remarkable that although they have had to suffer torture 
and oppression, the Jews have remained on a high level above that of their oppressors and steadfastly refused to mingle. Is this accurate today? Is it true today? When we come back, we're going to talk about a little bit of a disturbing incident. Not too much. I don't want to spend too much time on disturbing crapola. But a little disturbing incident that happened in America. And I want to know what happened to the Jews who were singled out, labeled, and again, ignore the writing on the wall. Andrea Simintov, see you on the other side. The Tamar Yona Show. Tamar? She's sassy. She's smart. She's funny. But she's also a real Jewish mother. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Shalom, I'm Leah Aharoni. Join me on my show, News from the Torah. Each Sunday, we'll use the weekly Torah portion as a prism for understanding the news today. Listen to News from the Torah to gain clarity about the times we're living in and to understand your own spiritual path in the process. News from the Torah every Sunday on Israel News Talk Radio. Okay, we're back. One second. I'm just writing into the chat room. <laughs> Got a very cute comment. I'm debating whether or not I can actually repeat it. It's very, very cute. Um, so again, so here we are. Okay, we're going to get back to all my favorite stuff. You know me, I can bury myself alive all day in Judaism. I can bury myself all day in Torah. I can bury myself <laughs> in all the stuff that we... Uh, that none of the none of the participants can get into the chat room. So, um, nevertheless, I am going to talk about just a little something. You may have heard about it. Those are my friends who are living in America, listening from America, or maybe Canada. I know that there are people even here in Israel. Let's see, we're seven hours away from America, so that would be. Uh, there's a show very popular. I know that when I was in high school, I loved it. I think it started in 1972, and it's called Saturday Night Live. We all know about Saturday Night Live. Some of the greats came out of that. Remember John Belushi, Chevy Chase, Lorraine Newman, the late Gilda Radner, fabulous, fat Eddie Murphy, fabulous talents. It used to be funny. And you know what? Maybe, perhaps my memory is jaded. I don't remember in the early days, I don't remember it being mean. Or shall we say, open season on the vulnerable. Open season, what is open season? Hitler could tell us about open season. season. Gaddafi could tell us about open season. Somehow it is open season in the world when it comes to one group and one group alone, and you know whom I'm speaking of. When it comes to the Jews, it is open season because the enemies of the Jews, and even those who don't consider themselves enemies, they're just plain folk. We call, call things as they are. Oh, Jews have good senses of humor. After all, we invented the Catskill Comedy Clubs. We can take a joke, can't we? A comedian, a guy who I never laid eyes on, named Michael Che, made a joke last Saturday night on Saturday Night Live. I actually heard about it right after the show. I haven't watched it in years. Um, you know, it became so politically correct, so woke that it stopped being funny when people could laugh at themselves. And he made a joke. Hold on. My, my in-house studio was like, uh, <laughs> getting the screens getting dark. And he made a joke about, uh, it took into consideration the most vile anti-Israel propaganda. And I promise you, when you are dissing on Israel, you're dissing on 
Jews. So he took up Israel's, they're universally, you know, we have had a vaccine uh, campaign that has been admired world round. This is not a statement about whether or not I approve of the vaccine, want the vaccine, love the vaccine, want six vaccines, anti-vax, pro-vax, don't send me your friggin' videos anymore. Okay. But Israel's vaccine campaign has been celebrated around the world by medical professionals as being done uh, very, very, very adequately and has been available to all of her citizens. And so during there, what they have this weekly update, this cute little news show they do, he apparently impersonates a reporter and he says, Israel is reporting that they vaccinated half of their population, he noted on this weekend update segment. And he continues and he says, I'm going to guess it's the Jewish half. For starters, boys and girls, Israel is a lot more than half Jewish. Okay, and to see it otherwise, you have to include the population of the Arab territories and insist that Israel has no right to be the Jewish state. Let's go on and on. We have Muslims, we have Christians. Um, Everyone here in this country, if they choose, is entitled to this vaccine. You know, his joke also captures the gist of what I would say is the left, their little global line, which calls Israel a criminal for jabbing at the arms of their own citizens, but not for the Palestinian Authority. Well, I got to tell you something. The Palestinian Authority is responsible for health care in their own territories. This is information that's available to you. Haters are going to hate. It's not funny. No other group would take the poking. I'm not angry at Michael Che. I'm not angry at the producers of Saturday Night Live. I'm not PO'd at actors. You know what I think about actors. But you know what? The silence. Here it comes, baby. Think about Esther, knowing that history will unfold, but what will your role be? I have secular friends who have expressed no shock, no doubt, no discomfort publicly. And when they are uncomfortable at this kind of thing, what do they do? They ignore it and think it's only a joke. Antisemites, my friends, are not the problems. The antisemites are merely gnats. They're ordinary. Stop building monuments to teach museums to tell people how to be nicer and the genesis of Jew hatred. You know what antisemites are? They just are. But until Jews begin building their own values and understanding who they are, where they came from, and indeed why we were chosen for both the glory and the the ostracizing. Because I got to tell you, boys and girls, if Saturday Night Live defines you and ultimately silences you, you're already lost. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let me go. I just got to go into the chat room because this is really cute. We have my friend, my friend Rodney. Um, very cute. <laughs> he gave me a compliment. And he said, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you the big, the real complimentary stuff. You have to go into the chat room, and I wish you did. But the cutest stuff he said, heavy good stuff. Andrea, if you were a Catholic, you'd be a Jesuit. And I told Rodney, I think there may indeed even be a compliment in there. Okay, you keep listening, you keep writing in, and you keep you keep me sharp, Rodney. Okay, you keep me sharp. And um, I appreciate your input. All right, so there we go. Okay, the Megillah. The Megillah, the Megillah. It's become a big joke. It says, don't make such a big Megillah about it. The Megillah, the book of Esther, it's a story about Jews bringing God back to a place where it has just about disappeared. It's a great revival, a return to Jewish practice, observance, a return to identification with the Jewish state. As the Megillah ends, okay, everybody who listens to the Megillah twice every year, we almost can memorize it. We all know the words. As the Megillah ends, it says, to the Jews there was aura, that's light. There is Torah, there's simcha, which is joy, 
the joy which is Shabbos and Yom Tov. There is Sasson, one of my favorite Jewish names, which means gladness. And that is the the gladness of Milah, uh, the covenant of circumcision, Jewish sacrifice, and Yikar, honor, that is tefillin, Jewish majesty, the crown of God on everyone's head. Um, everyone's heart is happy. This is the story of Purim. It's not a minor holiday, boys and girls. They say that after the Moshiach, the Messiah, comes back, Purim will remain. It is a call to every Jew not to forget his identity, not to forget his duties. If you want, as you're listening to the show, if you're confused, if you don't know enough about Purim and you are Jewish, send me a note, Andrea at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. I will send you links that will absolutely connect you, teach you, enlighten you, and be a gift to you. All right. Remember, at the time of Purim, they were just about to forget when again something happens and wakes them up. The Torah tells us the light in the sanctuary came from pure olive oil. The more an olive is beaten, the better is the oil. Came across this lovely, uh, what do you say, a lovely allegory? I'm losing my English, but it's not being replaced with Hebrew. I will totally speak in code eventually. So it came up that the finest pianos, I didn't know this, Anybody know their musical instruments? The finest pianos are made from wood that has actually been exposed and, you know, weather exposed, tested by the weather. It produces the finest echoes and the sweetest, most dulcet music. Makes me think. Think about holy Jews who are trying, trying to get it right in this life. You know, it's not easy to get up in the morning for prayer to guard our words, to have respect, to eat according to a code of law and not grab the first thing on the supermarket shelf. It's not easy to give up time from sports and PlayStation. Do they use PlayStation anymore? And Netflix for a religious lesson. It's like beating an olive. But you know what? It produces the very best oil. Jews live in the Purim story. It's constantly unfolding each generation over and over. The story of Purim, it comes through the writings, but these are characters. These are prototypes for everything who we are. Let's say we have two minutes left here. Oh, quick, cute story from Rabbi Tversky who just passed away last month. Rabbi Tversky, a rabbi comes from the yeshiva and he's collecting money and he goes to a wealthy man. The wealthy man is known to be a miser. And the, the man says to him, there's no point in you coming to me for money. I don't give to yeshivas. And he says, I didn't come for a donation. I came to fulfill the mitzvah of Bikor Kolim, visiting the sick. You're a sickie. He says, I am not. I am perfectly healthy, the miser says, not really understanding this assessment. Oh, no, you're not, says the rabbi very calmly. King Solomon teaches us, there's a bad disease that I have seen, wealth that is kept to its owner's detriment. You are sick. And he says, but you know what? There's other sick people. What do you single me out for a visit? To which the rabbi says, Talmud says that if I, I'll take away one sixtieth of your disease if I visit you. What can I get if I visit someone with malaria? I'll get nothing but malaria, but you, one sixtieth, I will do Are you very in well your life? indeed. In a time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Political Hitman airs every Tuesday at 1159 p.m. North American time, 7 a.m. Israeli time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio.
Okay, so a good rule is do not go onto Facebook in between breaks, during commercial breaks, because you'll read like really disgusting articles about things like ground coffee and what they put in face creams. Okay, not a good idea. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, let me shut this off. You see, it's like just being together. We just mellow out and we're together. This is the final segment. I cannot believe how fast this is going. Um, yeah. So um, today, here we go. Today, what is the name of this week's Parsha? I'm really, today's Parsha is Tate Savve. And it coincides, actually, because Purim is coming before Shabbos this year. So um, nevertheless, this is our Shabbos show and it's our Purim show. So I'm going to speak quickly because I have so much I want to share here. Oy, va, voy, va, voy, la, no. All right. Again, as we finish up with our Purim, we're going to try to blend it, do the work together. You know, today, who, who in our world can actually play Mordecai and Esther? Where are they? Where are they when we need them the most against all odds? You know, they ignored the ice from the advice from their friends, from tyrants, um, they, they, their enemies threaten them constantly, but Mordechai, he's not going to kneel down. He won't bow to false gods and cruel tyrant, tyrants. Queen Esther, we know what she does. She really indeed risks her life. She risks her position. She risks her honor. She risks her wealth, her comfort. It's not easy. It's why we're fasting today to come to the aid of her people in their hour of need. What happens? She can forget for a moment the station to which she has found herself and arose, and she discovers that she's a Jewess first, and only second is she the queen of Persia. These two people, Mordecai and Esther, they've set very, very high standards for the Jewish behavior in later generations. Guess what? They were dealing with Jews. They were criticized from within, and they were persecuted, uh, persecuted from without. They persevered in their loyalty, but their commitment to Torah remained true. You know, there are a lot of people who are among us today, just like them. What are we supposed to be doing instead of sitting numb as we're lambasted and challenged and mocked and indeed targeted? We have to recognize them. Who are our Mordecais? Who are our Esthers? Together, we have to strengthen them, support them against the misguided other Jews who cower. All of us have the ability to fill our own playbill with the characters, the heroes, the villains, the supporting cast, the cameos. Construct our own current living Purim story. We live in incredible times when miracles abound for the Jewish people. Anybody who has been living in Israel in the last 70 plus years knows that it's not just the splitting of the Red Sea. But you know what, crazy Jews? We have to have these dangerous circumstances to bring about any semblance of Jewish unity. This is something I know and I'm sad to report. I confess the husband and I talk about this all the time. When Israel is at peace, when Israel is not under threat, we're disgusting to one another here. We protest, we label, we point fingers. Some of the ugly coming out of the mouths of Jewish Israelis towards groups of other Jewish Israelis is unrepeatable, dissension. But under pressure, when katushas are falling, when molotovs are happening, when children are hiding, God forbid, Loa Lena, which shouldn't happen again, in bomb shelters, we're united. I'm gonna turn the page. Mordechai and Esther, for a lot of Jews, they were a little too Jewish. They were a little too brash, they were a little too stubborn. And they're singled out by our enemies. Don't go with these guys. They're too clannish. They're provocative. They're endangering your situation. Mordechai and Esther in their time, they did not receive universal support, a round of applause. <laughs> they didn't have their own party in Israel. We cannot expect that people who aspire to be the Mordechais and Esthers among us in our time should be universally accepted, to be loved, to be admired. This is the reality of Jewish and human life. 
that in order to be accepted and factored into the general pursuit of good and noble, sometimes you have to be a puppet. Nevertheless, boys and girls, hidden miracles, they abound. They're teeming in our current world as far as we crazy, mysterious Jews are concerned. Anyone who has the good fortune of living today in the land of Israel knows that on a daily basis, breathe in, breathe out, the miracles are with us. So again, this year, in Jerusalem, the Torah reading coincides with the day of Purim itself. Okay, there's a lot of similarities between this Torah reading and the reading of the book of Esther. My favorite of, let me just say, wait a second. Oh yeah, here it is. The unseen, the unmentioned director of, um, oh, here it is. No, 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 this is what I wanted to share. I'm all over the map today. Stay with me, stay with me, Rodney. There are a lot of comments by the scholars of Israel over the ages. They try to explain why this is the portion this is the parsha that Moshe's name never appears even though we're very aware that it's Moses who wrote this chapter of the Torah and he taught it to the Jewish people he made them sit he made them learn we're aware that he's the hidden author the director so to say of the events behind the scenes don't I have a lot of like theatrical uh allegory today I really do there's a lot of comments but for the purposes of what I'm going to say today, and I got a lot of this from Rabbi Beryl Wine, really a, 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 a master teacher. He teaches us that it's sufficient to understand that Moshe is the teacher of the Torah beyond compare, but he's hidden from us. We're made aware of the value of people and ideas that is really hidden and not always exposed to the light of human inspection, society, gossip column, front page of the Washington Post. The ability of Moshe to remain hidden and who, the actual benefit of his anonymity is one of the blessings of his incredible character and his humble greatness. So in the same vein, we also find that in the book of Esther, this is a little trick that we play with children with teaching them the Purim story. We say, how many times is God mentioned in the book of Esther, in Megillus Esther? And the children are, honey, you know, now four, nine, a hundred. You know. And the answer is none. There's no reference whatsoever made of the intercession, you know, intercession and any kind of interference of heaven on the events written in the story of Purim. The book of Esther is basically, it's like, a, it's like a script. It's exciting, it's rational, it's sexual, it's romantic. It's, there's a lot of treason involved. It's an understandable story of intrigue, political nuance, psychologically damaged individual, salvation, twists, turns. There's an unseen, unmentioned director of events. Purim, is the holiday that commemorates human ability. Our ability, because we are created in his image, the hidden him, to actually control our futures. You know, there's no flash of lightning. There's no roars of thunder. There's no volcano, you know, volcanoes, no tsunamis. And yet it's obvious when we read this whole story together, it's miraculous. It pulsates. Perhaps this is why Purim is such a day of such kooky, unmitigated joy. We drink. Jews, we're not big on drinking. We're not good at it. We're very sloppy drinkers. We like the sweet ones with the, you know, the umbrella in the glass. Because Purim represents joy. The thousands who have discovered it and unraveled the mystery and have come to understand that they themselves are part of that mystery. When a hidden treasure is revealed, humans are usually, they're overcome with feelings of happiness, feelings of achievement. You know, there was a great Hasidic master, the Hasidic master of Kotsk. God, say that three times fast. The Hasidic master of Kotsk. And he continually maintained that truth is always hidden from public view. He said that if truth were actually revealed, hello world, it would be criticized. It would be reviled. It would be discounted. You know what? We live in a false world. And to use the phrase that the Talmud chose to describe 
this human experience. Ultimate truth, it can only be found within our own selves, our hidden selves. And it takes a lot of effort, enormous effort and striving and searching to find it. It's easier to be shallow. It's easier to make it all cosmetic. Only the hidden eventually proves to be true, accurate, eternal. You know, the word in Hebrew for face is panim. Panim. You say, hey, a little cute panim, a shena panim. Whereas in English, it's face. It comes from facade, external, um, veneer, the stuff that's outside. But panim, face, is the root of the word bifnim, inside. That's why falsehoods, they're wherever we turn. But the face, the eyes do not lie. It is not only fake news that's confounding us, but it's also that we live in an era where society is shaped by the opinions of others. The Torah wants to give us a direction where truth can be found. It's hidden in the name of Moshe in this week's Parsha. It's hidden in the name in the book of Esther. To understand and to find God, we have to look inside. And the same is the truth when it comes to understanding and appreciating Torah. It's not superficial, my friends. It's deep within our souls. Purim Sameach and Shabbat Shalom from Jerusalem. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from League City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Frank Garrett from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 